record on this computer. So it is about 1.30 on the 30th. Tomorrow, think about that, guys. Tomorrow is October. We are finally into October, right? And if you don't know, I don't know if you guys have known this or not, but October has two full moons. We have a regular full moon and we have a blue moon. And the second full moon is on Halloween. And the last time we had this was May. And that's when everything went chaotic. So maybe if we have it during Halloween, everything will reset and we'll go back to normal. That's the only thing we can hope for, right? All right, so fractions. Oh. So we talked about addition of fractions where you have to have a common denominator. Well, same thing has to happen here when we do subtraction of fractions. We can't subtract unless we have common denominators. Again, at the end, you've got to reduce the fraction. So if I came down to the end of this fraction here and I had something where it was like 15 thirtieths, I have to make sure I reduce that to one half. So just be aware, don't lose easy peasy points by not reducing. I'm just saying, it's happened before. Multiplying fractions. Good news with multiplying fractions is you don't have to do anything wrong. Same thing with dividing. There's a little bit to do with dividing, but with multiplying fractions, I prefer setting them up horizontally, and then you just multiply across the numerator, multiply across the denominator, and you are done. One of the things you will find out when you're multiplying fractions is typically your answer is going to come out to be a smaller number than either of your fractions that you're multiplying. So like here we have 7 eighths times 1 fourth. You're going to multiply seven times one, eight times four. Your answer is going to be seven thirty seconds. That answer is smaller than both of these two problems here. Just because that's what happens with multiplication. And the same thing will happen with multiplication with uh, decimals. When you multiply decimals together, your fraction is your decimal is going to come out smaller than your decimals you started with. If you have whole numbers, remember that if you're multiplying times a whole number, two is the same thing as saying two over one. So here we have it. We're gonna multiply one over six times two over one. Our answer comes out to be two six. Well, we've got to reduce that. So two six reduces to one third. What if we have a problem that looks like this? Five six times one and one third. Can we still do that? What's the first thing we have to do to this here? First full moon's tomorrow, that's kind of creepy. Make it an improper fraction. Right, there we go, exactly. Make that an improper fraction. So one times three is three, plus one means that's an improper fraction is four thirds. Now, I'm horrible at writing with the mouse. Now we've got a simple problem. Five times four, 20, right? Six times three is what? Eighteen. So now we got 20 eighteenths, right? Now we simplify that out. We know that we've got one there. So we got one, two eighteenths, or one and one ninth. So we got to make it an improper fraction before we do anything. Again, good news for you guys is if you have this, when you get to your quiz question about this, you just come up here to the part that makes it a fraction. And you make a fraction. And you do it in your calculator. In the real world, that's the way you're going to do it. I mean, there are times where we have to do fractions in the real world, but not too often, honestly, nowadays. World is becoming dumber. We just did this, multiplying by mixed numbers. There we go. Some common math sense with fractions. Any number over itself equals one. So if, even if we have one bajillion over one bajillion, it's still one. I don't know why we'd want to do that, but whatever. Right? Eight over eight is one. 128 over 128 is one. 14 over 14 is one. Any numerator with a denominator of one is the same as the whole number. So four over one is four. Six over one is six, right? What about if we had, instead of a, instead of one there, 
We had six over zero. Can we do that? No, right? That answers. It's usually smaller, yes. Now there are some weird rules in math, Riley, where it does come out a little bit bigger, but I'm not gonna focus on those weird rules, right? Six over zero, what's, if I put that on a test, what would be the proper answer for that? There'd be a couple different things you could say, but is that solvable? Mm. No, because that's a divide by zero error, right? If you put that in the calculator, what you'll get is this, div zero, right? Or it'll just go ERR. <laughs> Right? Technically that, I mean, it's not even technically an unknown answer at that point, it's, it's an error, right? We can't do that. Um, for those of you that have your, your iPhones, whenever you get a chance, ask your wonderful assistant, what happens when you divide zero by zero? She tells you a great little story about that. So just, just ask, I'm not gonna say her name because three things in my immediate vicinity will light up because I said the S word. Um, the S-I-R-I -I word. Great, you can't even spell it. No, I did not want to talk to you. Um, so a great story about Cookie Monster and zero by zero, so it's fantastic, right? But nothing, anything over zero is an error, right? If you get that with any of my questions, more than likely you did something wrong. And then any number can be a whole number, or any whole number can become a fraction by just putting a one as a denominator kind of talked about that when we were up here with this number here, right? We talked about, you know, one six times two, we can make that two over one and we've got a new fraction. All right, division. Oh, yeah, we got somebody else joined us. Oh, bye. Oh, no. where am I going? There we go, division. Division when it comes to fractions is multiplication of reciprocals. And reciprocal means the inverse. So two, over, two thirds, the inverse is three seconds. 22 over 35, the inverse is 35 seconds. It simply inverts the numerator over the denominator. So if I'm doing a problem where I'm doing one half divided by one half, Technically, what I'm really doing there, because you have to kind of do the conversion, is you're doing one half times two over one. You're just going to flip it. Yep, change the flip. Because most people will see this and they'll just multiply it out. They'll say, oh, well, one times one is one, one times two is four. No, we're not doing multiplication there. That is wrong. Eh, wrong answer. So our answer is gonna come out to be two over two, which is the same as saying one. And we're gonna do some problems together then. We'll see if we get it today or if we get it to a Monday when I can actually write with a real pencil on the screen. It can make things a lot easier for me. Because I'm a horrible writer. So here we got one half divided by one fourth. What we're gonna do then is flip Right, so we have the dividend, we have, we have the dividend, where's my annotate? Give me yellow, I like yellow. What do you say when you answer the phone? Yellow, right? There's our dividend, there's our divisor. We're gonna invert that divisor. So we're gonna come down here and one half divided by one fourth is the same as saying one half times four over one. And if you really are interested in the 100%, which probably none of you are, the, the math theory behind that, the real way to write that question is this way. That's why it gets inverted because we have to eliminate this. And so that's how it ends up turning into one half times four over one. What you're really doing here is Dividing a decimal by a decimal.
Um, typically, like I said, multiplication fractions are going to create a smaller number, whereas usually division creates a larger number than its parts, right? And if we can see that right here, two is bigger than both one fourth and one half. Now, there are weird, re strange reasons when we get into parabolas and stuff like that, which is way beyond what you guys have to know, that that can get kind of in jinxed up. And I don't even want to talk about that because that can fry some of your brains on why that happens. Um, it's kind of similar to there actually is a theorem where they've actually proven that zero equals one. And if we actually are to postulate that even further, that totally blows up our whole mathematics system. So we're not going to do that. So decimals in healthcare systems. We're looking at here is one of our patients' favorite drugs in the whole wide world. Vicodin, right? Otherwise known by patients calling it Vikes or vitamin V. I've heard it referred to as before. Otherwise known as pain meds, right? This pain med in particular, when you look at it, has a couple different decimals and fractions in it. This one shows that this has 7.5 milligrams of the first medication. And then it has 300 milligrams of the second medication. So the first medication in this case is hydrocodone by bi tartrate, right? Which is the opiate, right? That's what, when you have patients that want drugs, that's what they want. They want that hydrocodone by tartrate. And you can actually get it without the Tylenol. And if you, they can get it without the Tylenol, they'd prefer it because that's the part that's gonna give you the high, right? And then you have 300 milligrams of acetaminophen, which is nothing more than Tylenol, right? Little soapbox here for me. This has 300 milligrams of Tylenol in it. Does anyone know what your recommended daily max of Tylenol is supposed to be? See a lot of head shaking, no. So your max Tylenol you're supposed to take is three grams or 3000 milligrams. Now, if you take more than 3000 milligrams, does that automatically mean you're gonna die? No, right? But the therapeutic max dose for a day is about three grams. If you take higher than that, you run the risk of getting sick and you take a lot higher than that, you run the risk of actually damaging your liver. Tylenol is probably one of the worst medications, it's the best medication on the market for analgesia. It's also one of the worst medications for your liver. Um, Tylenol can just absolutely destroy your liver if you want it. A lot of patients, the problem with this is They'll get this medication, it's got 300 milligrams Tylenol. So they're recommended, they're supposed to take four of these caplets a day, right? So they're getting 1200 milligrams of Tylenol per day, just in these pills here. And then on top of that, they're like, well, I'm having more pain. So they go over to the medicine cabinet and pop some Tylenol extra strength. Right, Tylenol extra strength is 500 milligrams per capsule. The only reason I've seen this, I've seen a lot of patients come into the hospital with Tylenol induced toxicity. You know, well, I took nine Tylenol on top of my Vicodin. Well, you, congratulations, Sherlock, you just fried your liver. Now they can purge your liver by doing um, all kinds of dialysis, but this can really mess up your liver bad. It can also happen if you've got a patient that's addicted to hydrocodone or addicted to any meds and also drinks. Tylenol is by far the worst thing you can take if you have a hangover because your liver is already kind of in sleep mode from the alcohol and then you pop Tylenol in, which is processed in the liver and you can really do damage to your liver. Better to do something that'll destroy your stomach like Advil or Aleve. None of the drugs ever do good things to your body. Did you ever notice that? Every time you see a drug on television, they're like, side effects may include death. Oh, and also headache and mild muscle spasms. Great. Wait, what did you say about death? But these, this is one of the favorite medications of patients just because of that hydrocodone. It's fun stuff, right? Thank you, Purdue, for giving us all kinds of pain meds that can kill people. Uh, so here we have decibels on a label. Here we have acetic acid, which is nothing more. I love, this is another one that I love. Acetic acid is nothing more than cider vinegar. And this bottle at the, it's an A, I promise that's an A. This bottle at the, or this bottle at your pharmacy is about probably 200 bucks. 
whereas you can go buy a whole bottle of cidal vinegar for 99 cents. So there's all kinds of fun stuff that the pharmacy gets you there with. So acetic acid, what do we prescribe acetic acid for? Let's say I've got a bone spur. I've got a bone spur on my lateral epicondyle of my humerus, right? I can use in physical therapy acetic acid, uh, putting it in my ultrasound gel and then drive it with ultrasound into that bone spur and it can soften that bone spur. So it gets broken down a little bit better and gets reabsorbed into the body. Because what happens with bone spurs, two things. Either they break down and get reabsorbed by the body or your body forms a casein around it, which is basically a hard shell and they have that bone spur there forever. And that can be a problem. Heel spurs are next. I use acetic acid a lot on heel spurs. Um, you know, there are different uses of it in dermatology as well for like uh, sebaceous cysts and stuff like that. But pretty much anytime you see an acid, the goal of it is to melt something, right? Hydrochloric acid the goal in your stomach, the goal of it is to melt everything in your stomach so it can become a goo that way it can be passed on and minerals can happen. It typically won't as long as you mix it right with ultrasound gel. It won't damage. So somebody asked, will it damage the ultrasound machine? Not if you mix it right. And that's where the doctor is going to say, so this is a, so we're looking at here, we're looking at a, what's called a 0.25 molar acetic acid, which means it's a really low, most of, most of this, when you're looking at this, right, most of this acetic acid is water. So 0.25%, it's really kind of low, even the pH here, right? pH is pretty low, actually, when you look at this one, because it's a 3.1 but it won't damage it as long as we mix it with ultrasound gel. And the ultrasound gel will bring down the acidity of it, but it acts as a transport medium so that the ultrasound head is going through the ultrasound gel, driving the medication in. We can also use this with um, E-stim and iontophoresis as well, because this is a negative medication. We can drive it into the skin through that. The other kind of stuff we're going to talk about later in physics. You guys are getting ahead of me. I love it. I love it. It says, not for injection. Right? Why did they put that on there? Because somebody somewhere injected acetic acid into their veins, right? Which is why now, if you look at bleach, there is a new protect, new warning on bleach, not for internal or injectable use. I feel like I'm like Kevin from Home Alone, because we now have to tell people don't inject bleach into your veins. I'm just saying, shouldn't that be common sense, maybe? So decimals represent a part or a whole, just like a fraction, right? So here we have $144.99. And I don't know why you don't have that extra penny, but we were missing that extra penny there to make it 105, right? That's why if you, for those of you, you remember writing, how many of you guys remember writing checks? So checks are these pieces of paper that people used to be able to write out and pay bills with. I still have a checkbook, believe it or not, right? There was, when I learned in school, oh, that's fantastic. I don't think I've written a check probably in, I don't know how long. Probably the last check I wrote was to pay off my truck. Um, when you write, when you write checks, we used to learn it in school. I don't think they teach it anymore in high school. They used to, have to teach you that when you write out and you write out, the, you're writing out the answer and you're going $104, anytime that you put that and now you're going to your cents, right? 10 over 100, whatever it may be. They don't teach that as much anymore. They don't teach a lot in school anymore, but that's a side point. Mainly because they're teaching that new math stuff. Writing without a whole number of decimals are usually less than one. So if you have 0.89, it's less than one. 0.123 is less than one. If you don't have a whole number, it's gonna be less than one. You're typically in math going to drop the trailing zero to prevent errors. And this is a caveat unless we're talking science. Sometimes in science, that zero is important. Does anyone know what we call that? Well, it's called a significant figure, right? And that means that when we're multiplying or doing math in science, there were that many numbers that we multiply it by. I don't know why science does that. I've never learned the theorem behind that. I just know in physics, it was a pain in the butt thing that I always got answers wrong on. Because I would take that zero and get rid of it. And they're like, your answer is partially correct, but you forgot your significant figure of zero. Go away. I'm not going to be that um, specific. I was thinking of a better word than what I wanted to use on that. 
um, that's specific on it. If it's 0.719 or 7.19, that's going to be your answer. So reading, you're going to say the numbers from left to right. So in this case, we have 42. 42 would be the first thing. And then we're going to see how far out we go. And we go out to our thousandths column here. So here we have 42 and 125 thousandths. If you have a zero out here, you'd be 1,250, 10,000. I don't know why you do that and make yourself that more difficult, but you could theoretically do that. Break decimals in words, two and two tenths, five and 14 hundredths. There's all kinds of ways you can write these out. You can also turn decimals into fractions, which we'll talk about, right? When you're looking at words and turning them into decimals, the key thing you want to look for in words is the THS. Right? If it doesn't have tethesis, it's a whole number. If it says three, if this is not here and it says three tens, what is it really saying? It's referring to the whole number. Yeah, it's saying 30, right? Like 30. It's the whole number 30. Good. But because we have that tis out here, that means we're doing a decimal. So as we go down, right, we got 12,000. 12,000, right? All of those come along the way. That tells us we've got a decimal out here. Well, that's great. Why do I have to know this, Mr. McKeever? Well, this may come into play when we talk about medication dosages, which we have a couple problems coming up to work on. So rounding can help make numbers manageable or easier to work with, right? So here we have this long, right? 14.38757. Well, in reality, we can round this. This is approximately close. I don't know why I've got a question there. I don't know what happened to that sign. <laughs> Excuse me. It's approximately close to 14.4. This is going to come into play in your grades. Because let's say you have, at the end of the semester, a 92.6. This is where I start getting emails. Mr. McKeever. I've got a 92.6. Is there any way you can get 93? You know what I'm going to say? You already have a 93. Because in our system, this is going to round it up to a 93. So congratulations, you get an A. Right? Now, you have a 92.4. You're at a B at that point. What I would hope is that you would know that going into it. So hopefully I don't get a message on the final day of class going, is there any extra credit I can do to get that point one? That really annoys me. Um, you should know by the time your final is graded where you are. And I'm going to tell you, if you're in any, doesn't matter what class it is. If you're in any class and you're at like 86.4 and you email saying, is there any extra credit I can do to get an A? What do you think the probable answer to that is? No, there's no way you can pull in with any amount of extra credit, pull an 86 up to an A. If you're at a 92.4, there's reasonable amounts that you may be able to. I'm not going to say I'm going to say no. I'm not going to say I'm going to say yes. It's going to depend, right? It's much like what type of underwear gets spread around the hospital. What depends, right? So, all right, I got some chuckles going. I right, hit some of you. Good. You know, it depends upon your whole thing. If you've done a lot of extra credit already for the semester, the likelihood of me giving you anything else to boost that grade is low, right? If you've done everything you can and you've worked hard, maybe. I don't know. I can't promise you either way. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Let me tell you the fun of me because this talks about decimals here. So for those of you that don't know, I am a PTA. I am a PTA not for lack of trying to become a PT. I went to PT school. In all of my summer classes, my GPA was 4.0, except for one in class, anatomy lab, which I'm now the lab assistant for, which is hilarious. In order to pass the school I went to, you had to have an 80%. In the first semester of anatomy lab, my grade was Seventy nine point nine eight nine repeating. 
my instructor said, sorry, you've got a 79, you're kicked out of the program. And for those of you that don't know, for those of you that are considering going on for PT school, let me just give you this little nugget. Once you are kicked out of a PT program, you will never get back into another PT program. You are blacklisted. Because every time you apply for a PT program, what do you think the first thing is that comes up in the application system? That, that you're kicked out. And so why would they take me into the program when they've got 175 other applicants that haven't been kicked out of our program yet. I mean, I can make arguments back because I'm awesome, but that's beside the point. So that's my story with going through PT program. It was sad. It was, it just wasn't in the cards. The good news is because I didn't become a PT, I became an instructor here. So and silver lining, whatever. And now that I see what a PTs are going through, I'm actually kind of happy. I don't have to do all the crap they do. I'm just going to be honest. And I see all the documentation PTs do. They can have it. It is what it is. So that's why I always joke that my, my initials are NOT DPT. I love it that way, not DPT. Um, and whether you call me Professor McKeever or Mr. McKeever, I don't care what you call me. I'll, t I'll correct you if you call me doctor because I'm not a doctor of anything. I do have my master's and a couple other things, but I don't want to be called Master McKeever. That just sounds creepy, right? Master McKeever, I have a question about math feel like you're Gollum coming to me with the precious or something. Um, don't, oh yeah, I don't care what you call me. I, I'm so used to being called McKeever that it, uh, whatever. Our school just wants you to call me Mr. or whatever. So whatever the school says, whatever, I don't care. Um, there's, so there are some PTs that don't want to be called doctor because they don't feel they have a clinical doctor, a medical doctorate. They have a regular doctorate, which is in physical therapy. So they don't even want to be called doctor, but academia is a little different. Anyway, got off tangent there. So rounding. Anytime we have to round like we did before, underline the place which you are rounding to, look to the letter, the number beside it, and if it's four or less, it goes down. That's a really bad arrow, it goes down. If it's five or more, it goes up. So like we had something where your grade was an 87.4. When I go to put your grade into our portal system, which is what you'll see your grade on, It'll say, oh, well, this is four. That rounds down to a zero. So your final grade is an 87. Right? If you come in here, <laughs> making the eraser sound, it makes it better. If I come in here and your grade is an 87.6, when I put that into portal, it'll say, oh, well, that is greater than, that, that's, that's supposed to be a greater than sign, five. So now you have an 88. Congratulations. Can that help you in the long run? It actually can, right? If you can get that little bit of a difference between 88 and 87, we'll talk about how to calculate your grades coming up. It's gonna be one of the lessons I go through, how to know where you are in classes. Because in the end, um, again, I'm gonna use myself as an example. I graduated summa cum laude from Penn State for, with my psychology degrees. What cost me graduating magna cum laude was my research project where I got a 87 instead of an 88. I had an 87.4, didn't have an 87.5. That 0.1 cost me to round that one down. That one percentage point rounded me down out of the magna cum laude. I'm not bitter about that at all. Dr. Siemens. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't really care about my grades, but it's just, that's kind of the way it is. So we will look at your grades and I'll show you how to look because all of your grades are going to be weighted. So one of the things that a lot of people don't get when they're looking at grades is, well, if I add all my grades together, I get this. Eh, not really, because that is not weighting your grade properly. We do do, we do do, great, do do, weighting. All right, so comparing decimals. Rely on your eyes if you have them. If you don't rely on your eyes, I don't want to help you with you can't be in PT. Line them up, add zeros for empty places, read them left or right and figure out which one is larger. So in this case, we have 0.081 and 0.28. I don't even, I rely on my eyes just looking at that and go, oh, I've got nothing in the tenths place here. I've got something in the tenths place there. 0.28 is larger. I don't even go through this lining up stuff that the book talks about because it just, that's the way my brain works, right? 
But let's change from pink because pink is getting old for me. Let's go to burgundy. If we have something like this and 0 0.184, now it does help to line them up so you can see which one's larger. OK, so 1, 1, they match up. They're the same. 8, 8, they match up. They're the same. Oh, wait. Here we have 7. That's the larger of them. That means that 187 is the larger number. And then murder was the case that it gave you. All right, I appreciate uh, And Riley got a little smile there. I appreciate it. Or Dobby. <laughs> so measuring the syringes. Syringes use decimal units. Most of them do at least, right? Syringes measure volume, not weight. This is the big question, right? Do you ever have somebody ask you which is heavier, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? Which is heavier? The trick question. See what I get. A pound is a pound, exactly. Weight is weight, right? Which is, which, which is heavier, a pound of fat or a pound of muscle? Doesn't matter, it's a pound, right? Volume is different. How much space something takes up, right? If we look at muscle versus fat, which do you think takes up more space? A pound of fat or a pound of muscle? Yeah, fat, right? I can, I can attest to that right now. Um, <laughs> some of us can look at the backside and go, yeah, I can attest to that as well, right? I'm not saying people are fat, please don't think that, but in, using it in the anatomical term, we'll call adipose, how about that, right? So by, by weight, everything's the same. A pound is a pound is a pound is a pound, right? But by volume, things take up different areas, right? And sometimes you have that. Sometimes you have that friend that just has the bigger volume that just takes up more space in your life. He may weigh the same amount as somebody else, but he just takes up more space. He or she takes up more space in your life. So syringes are measuring how much liquid volume is there, right? The units are either in cc's or ml's. So which is greater, one milliliter or one cubic centimeter? Let's see if anyone can answer that. Anyone take a guess? Okay, so I got one milliliter. All right, we got one centimeter. So we're we're uh, we got we're all over the place. Good. Here's a hint: they're the same. One cc equals one ml. And I have a funny story about that. So one ml equals one cc. They're the same just different ways of measuring the volume, right? Liter, we typically think of measuring liquid volume. CCs, we typically think of measuring physical volume, but they're the same thing. Um, I had a patient in the hospital one day, total knee replacement patient, and he was just the most cantankerous patient in the world, but he was so funny and I loved working with him. But he was just one of those old guys that, like if you told him the sky was blue, he was gonna argue that it was actually purple and nothing you told him was gonna differ it. And it was just hilarious to work with him. The day's, how's it going, Bob? The day's going great. No, it's not, it sucks. So I used to walk in and be like, man, today sucks. No, it's a good day. Great, let's get going. <laughs> he had a nursing student that was out at the, front, the desk and I, she was drawing up Bob's pain med for me. And she looks over at one of the nurses there and she goes, and I'll never forget, she's like, so like, the doctor sent over his orders and said that he's supposed to get five cc's of morphine, but like my syringes are only in milliliters. How am I supposed to know how many milliliters to give this patient? I'm like, put the syringe down, go talk to your nurse that's instructing you, please. I don't want you touching my patient until you've had proper instruction. How did you make it through the first year of nursing school without knowing that a CC is the same as an ML? Like that terrified me, right? So a CC is the same as an ML. So a lot of times we're gonna, if you see here, like this one here says one ML, right? Down here, we got the baby CCs, right? 0.1 ML, 0.5. All of this is usually looking at how we do this. What are we gonna use these syringes for? Well, maybe measuring, like I said, acetic acid. If you see a syringe down here, like that bottom one, 
even though it looks like kind of a baby syringe, a lot of that's an insulin syringe, right? Now, the good news is insulin's come a long way nowadays. We used to have to measure it. And some of you maybe that are, maybe, I don't know if any of you are type one diabetic that you have to use insulin. But I mean, according to our president, it's cheap as water. I, I don't know what kind of water he's ordering, but um, the syringe itself, you know, you used to have to measure out your insulin, stick yourself with it. Well, now we've got pens, right? You don't even have to do measurements anymore. You put your, you see what your blood glucose is. You look at your little chart. It says three knob turns. You do three knob turns, in goes your insulin. We have made insulin even easier, right? But what it's really doing is calculating out the milliliters of how much insulin that patient needs. We do addition of decimals. The important part is lining them up and adding zeros in empty places to the right to make everything easier, right? So here we have 2.46 plus 0 0.005 plus 1.3. We're gonna line them all up. So we have 2.46, but here we have three digits. So we're gonna add a zero out here just to make it nice and easy to do. We got 0 0.005 lined up beautifully. Well, 1.3, we'll add those two zeros to make it easy. And then we just add up down the lines. And same thing with any other math, if we should get down here and it's greater than nine we just carry it over like we do with any other math thing right good news is again for you guys you got your calculators if you want to write it out and do this hand math just confirm that you're doing it right do it i do hand math a lot just to keep my brain active um really it's not that much different than doing activity puzzles and stuff like that that other people do that sudoku stuff that i don't understand i don't, I don't know how i've made it through life and i still don't comprehend those things subtraction of decimals same thing Right? We're going to line them up, typically put the larger one on top and subtract down. Unless, of course, we're subtracting by a negative number, but that's a totally different thing we'll talk about with, an, with uh, oh my god, algebra. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. So here we have 95.5. We're subtracting 0.76. So in this case, maybe we want to lower the patient's temperature by 0.76 and we need to know where to get them. Well, this is how we do it. There are times where we may lower a patient's temperature. If your patient has scarlet fever, which is a pretty bad condition, that their fevers can get upwards of 107 degrees. Now, once you get above 104, does anyone know it starts happening to your body? Your brain starts cooking, literally. You might be that commercial with this is, your, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, and they crack the eggs in the frying pan. What 104 plus degrees, literally, your brain is in a frying pan, right? Because heat can't escape your skull. So we may have to lower it. And I've seen it where the doctors will order, patient needs body temperature lowered by five degrees or 5.5 degrees. We need to be able to figure out what we need to get to because we have to monitor the patient's temperature because if they're saying lowering it by a specific degree and a half, there's a reason why they're doing that because they're taking them to their thermal limit of what is safe. So we may have to do an ice bath with the patient, which patients really love getting in big tubs of ice. I'm just telling you. Like I loved it in football when they set you in the big Hubbard tank of ice after a football game. No, I didn't. That sucked. Um, I think Chris, um, what's his name? Not Chris Rock. Um, who's the short comedian? Short black comedian. What's his name? Hart. What is it? Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Yes, there we go. That guy, right? Um, he has a show on YouTube, if you ever get a chance, that's talking to athletes in ice where he asks them all kinds of questions where they both get in an ice tub. It's hilarious, but that's nothing to do with that and subtracting either. Kevin Hart, that's his name. Yeah, I can't think of it. I guess it was Hart to remember. Anyway, <laughs> this is the way my brain works all day long, folks. Just get ready. It's probably why I'm single. Multiplication of decimals. The main thing with multiplication of decimals you have to realize is when you're looking at your multiplication of decimals, if you have the decimals, you should end up with approximately the same number of decimal positions as you have here. So if I have 4.75 times 0.4, I have one, two, three decimal positions. In the end here, I should end up with one, two, three decimal positions. Now our answer came out to 1.99 or 1.900, so we don't have to we don't need those, right? 
but that's how you look at it. So like we have one, let's do another one here. Let's go blue now. I like blue. Let's do 7.37 times 0.2. So if we have 7.37 times 0.2, we know that our final answer is going to have three decimal spots because we have one, two, three. So we're going to line that up, 7.37. There's a point there on us. And we're multiplying it times 0.2. Right? So at 14, at 7, 14. So we know that we had three decimal points. So we've got 1.474. And again, just like I talked about with when we talked about fractions. When we're multiplying decimals, we got this and this, we're, we're going to end up less than our large number. And we've got some ex real examples coming up rather than these stupid math examples that we got here. Division of decimals. We place the decimal point and divide the numbers and add any zeros for missing numbers. So here we have dividing 2.58 by 6. So we put it out and we're looking at this. When we look at this, six can't go into two, right? Doesn't happen. But six can go into 25 and it goes into 25 four times. That leaves us with one. We bring down our eight, we have 18. Six goes into 18 three times. So we have 0.43 as our answer. The good news for you guys is you can literally go, okay, you know, 2.58, you hit your divisor sign, you hit six, you hit that equal sign, and it'll say 0.43. All right. Um, I highly recommend getting pretty decent at using calculators because it'll make your life a lot easier in the clinic, especially when we start talking about money for patients. Because as much as you guys may not think it, with the changes coming to Medicare, Medicaid, all the insurances, patients are getting a lot more paranoid about how much they have to pay for visits, right? I'm sure you guys are too. Right? Going to the doctor is not cheap. Going to physical therapy is not cheap. And so doc patients will be asking you, well, how much am I going to have to pay for this? And you have to calculate that stuff out. Telling them, go talk to the front desk isn't always the best answer anymore. Right? Because the front desk people may not have time for them. Right? Have you ever seen that front desk be really busy and they're like, I don't have time for you. Talk to the end. Right? So if you can help them with it, I always tell my patients when I talk about insurance, look, I'm not an insurance specialist. It looks like you pay about $35 a visit. Your whole time here, it's going to cost you about this much. Right? Don't ever tell them exacts because if you tell the patient exact, I'm going to guarantee they're going to come back at you. I always give them estimates. This is my rough estimate, Mr. Bob. Dividing decimals by decimals. You have to make the divisor a whole number, right? And you move that divisor, the whole number, by moving the decimal point to the right. If you move the divisor's decimal to the right, you have to do the same thing for the dividend, right? So here we have 0.62 divided by 0.42. We moved 0.42 two decimal points over here to the right. So we're going to do the same thing to our 0.62. So what this really works out to be is 42 divided by 62.16. It's great. This is how we do that long math for it. We're going to come out with our 1.48 in the end. On a positive note, if you want to do that, make sure, even if you do long mathematics, please, 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 for the love of everything, go back and check yourself with your calculator, right? Please get the right answer. Don't cheat yourself out of three points. So simplified shortcuts works with multiplications of 10, 100, 1,000 only. Can save time and money, and it's important in metrics. If you're multiplying, you can move the decimal point to the right. If you're dividing, move the decimal point to the left. Just remember to count the zeros. We have some examples coming up here. So if I have 45 times 10, 
I have a zero here, so I can move this decimal point one point to the right. And it's really saying, and I can eliminate my 10. I have 45 times one, which is 45. That's great. I mean, it helps a little bit. It's not so multiplications, the, the one that it's not so helpful. We're just moving decimal points. I find in division is where we actually have some of the helpfulness with this, right? So multiplying income, we have this. We have two zeros here. We're going to move that decimal point two points to the right. The answer is 14, 1423. Here we have three decimal points or three zeros. We're going to move that decimal point three spots over. This is the same thing when we talk about percentages, right? Because when you're doing, when you actually calculate out your grade, let's say that you have, you know, 75 out of 100 total points for a test, right? That means you have 0.75. Well, you don't have 0.75%. And I just saw this in a really, really bad factoid on Facebook making the rounds and it really upset me because the, let's clear this real quick. The CDC has the overall infection rate of COVID, that's a one. The overall infection rate of COVID as 0.0143. And so you've got some brilliant math scientists on Facebook saying, well, look, this is less than a hundredth of, or less than, you know, one tenth of a percent of people are getting sick from COVID. No, that's not a percentage. That's just the decimal. In order to convert that to a percentage, you've got to move this decimal point two points. So really what we're looking at is a 1.43 percentage of the population getting sick, right? That's a big difference because how many people do we have in the United States? Does anyone know? I don't want to do that. I want to close that for a second. Yeah, about 330 million. So let's just say we have 300 million. One, two, three, one, two, three. One percentage of those people, right? 0.0143 means that four, about four and a third million people are going to get sick from COVID. If you go by their standards, what they're saying, what the uh, brilliant math geniuses on Facebook are saying, what they're saying is that in reality, only 42,000 people are going to get sick by COVID. We already know that's not right because why? We already have more than that at this point, right? And in reality, uh, I'll, I'll teach you quick about that COVID now. In reality, this infection rate's not really what you want to be worried about. The infection rate's bad, right? What you really want to be worried about is what we call the r naught. Does anyone know what an r naught is in science? Like let's, so I use R not in the way of a restaurant. Let's say you go to Mickey's Tavern and you have really good service at Mickey's Tavern and it's, the food is phenomenal. It's great. Everything in the server keeps your beer filled the whole time if you drink beer, just one of those great experiences. There's an R not what we call a two for that. Meaning that if you had a good experience you're gonna tell on average two friends about that good experience. Those two friends are gonna tell two friends. Those friends are gonna tell two more friends and that's gonna branch out, right? Difference, now you go to Mickey's and Mickey's gives you really bad service. The r not for that is seven. So now you're gonna go tell seven friends. Those seven friends are gonna tell seven friends. Those seven friends are gonna tell seven more friends and it's gonna explode outwards. Does everyone see how kind of that works? The R naught for the average flu, does anyone know what the R naught for the average flu is? Has anyone heard that on the news? So R is it like two point something? Yeah, it's about 2.1, right. 
So what that means is if I get the flu, I'm going to give it to about two people. Those two people are each going to give it to two people on their own. Then it spreads out and spreads out and spreads out. That's how, you know, that's how epidemiology works. That's how everything spreads, right? We're looking at COVID right now and conservative estimates say that COVID is an R naught of 6.1. So if I get COVID, I'm going to spread it to about six people. Those six people are each going to spread it to six people. That spreads really rapidly. Ebola was an excellent example of that. If you, I don't know how many of you have looked into Ebola, but Ebola has about an R naught of about 10. So if somebody comes in with Ebola, usually it spreads really rapidly. The good news is in a civilized country like our world here, the, you guys getting Ebola is not going to affect anything. You get Ebola, you're going to get this upset tummy. It's going to be, feel like flu. You'll get over it, right? Problem with Ebola is in third world countries. This disease isn't like that, right? So this disease is totally different. And you know, there are some, some epidemiologists say it may be as high as 12 for the R naught of COVID. That's pretty scary stuff, right? And that's why it's really important that if you do get COVID, you stay away from people for a little while so that you don't give it to everyone else. Uh, I don't know if you guys have just saw it, but one of the NFL games, I think it's the Colts and I don't remember who it is. Colts and somebody or other. So Titans and Vikings. There we go. Thank you. The Vikings and who was it? The second one? The Titans. The Titans and Vikings. Thank you. Yeah, that was who it was. I don't know why I thought it was the Colts. Colts, Vikings. They're both going to lose. Um, they just canceled the game because they've got too many people that are sick. The Raiders got in trouble this weekend because they had like five members of their team that were positive and they let them play. Right? Uh, not good thing. Bad, bad, bad. So this is why this is why hockey did it right. I hate to say it. Hockey put them in a bubble, and if somebody was sick, they got yanked from the bubble. Um, we're seeing explosion all over the place. That's kind of this is that decimals plays into that. Anyway, what time we got? 18 after. So we're gonna have to stop here so that you guys can get a break before Dr. Johnson's class. I know. I'm, I know you're so mad that we have to stop math. Makes everyone so sad.